We're going to get started here in a minute or two, so. All right. Good morning. I'm going to uh, call to order the meeting of the uh, University of Minnesota Board of Regents this uh, October 14th, and we'll begin today's meeting. Uh, first of all, a, uh, a housekeeping announcement. Uh, Regent Omari may may connect with us. He's uh, he is abroad and uh, unavailable today, but uh, was going to uh, see what he could do. So. We may hear him uh, click in, but uh, otherwise not. It's October 12th, not October 14th, I'm told by, by my colleague to the left. Thank you, President Kaler. I don't know where I got uh, that from. But uh, anyway, uh, we're going to go up to the podium and recognize a very important vice president. <clears throat> Good morning, Chair McMillan. Since we now have verbatim indexed, videotaped, and otherwise recorded minutes, I thought it was important that we correct the, the day to October the 12th. Uh, I am uh, thrilled today uh, to introduce to you Dr. Michael Goh as the new Vice President for Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota. Michael, would you come stand with me, please, as I tell people a little bit about you. He has served as Interim Vice President for Equity and Diversity over the last year, and he's been part of the University of Minnesota community for nearly 25 years. Through his experience as a doctoral student, faculty member, Associate Vice Provost for Equity and Diversity, and Interim Vice President, he has gained a deep and broad knowledge of the university's opportunities and indeed our challenges. He's also prioritized strengthening connections between the university and communities throughout Minnesota, including the tribal nations of Minnesota. His commitment to inclusive excellence runs deep. In his roles as an inaugural University of Minnesota Multicultural Teaching and Learning Fellow and the President's Distinguished Faculty Mentor, he has promoted access, education, and mentoring to help underrepresented students succeed in higher education. His numerous awards for research, teaching, service, and leadership by local, state, national, and international associations reflect his community-engaged, scholar-practitioner approach to solving grand challenges. In addition to his administrative leadership positions, Dr. Goh is a professor in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy, and Development in the College of Education and Human Development here on our Twin Cities campus. A distinguished scholar and teacher, his focus on multicultural counseling, intercultural competence, and cultural intelligence brings an interdisciplinary lens to equity, diversity, and inclusion work. His passion for and commitment to intercultural competency and cultural intelligence are vital skills for a key leader in this position. I remind you that we launched a comprehensive national search for the system-wide position of Vice President for Equity and Diversity, and the best candidate was right here in our midst. An accomplished international scholar who knows Minnesota is deeply engaged in partnering with Minnesota communities to advance our common goals. And I am extremely confident that Dr. Goh will continue to foster and champion a system-wide university community that values and actively supports equity, diversity, and inclusion. With that, I ask you to please help me welcome Dr. Michael Goh as the new Vice President for Equity and Diversity at the University of Minnesota. Michael. Thank you, President Kayla, for your very kind remarks, and thank you, uh, Board of Regents. Uh, it's uh, easy to misunderstand that the Office of Edu uh, for Equity and Diversity is simply about social cultural issues, and that's often the case because we do have a system-wide uh, constituents that represent 
faculty, staff, students, and I would include administrators and border regions that bring their full selves, their social identities, their racial identities, their gender, their political, their geographies, their class, their abilities and disabilities, and, and, and they expect a safe, authentic environment where they can be who they are. But I think the current realities reflect that that tends towards more divisiveness, polarization, and to the extremes, discrimination, prejudice, and hatred. And for that reason, you will find that our office will emphasize not just institutional diversity, but interactional diversity. How do we do the belonging part? How do we do the everyone part better? Through our education, through access, through compliance, and in collaboration with offices like the Provost Office, undergraduate and graduate education, human resource colleges, and our system campuses. So I am, for that reason, clarifying that while social and cultural knowledge and the benefits are certainly welcome, we do so because we believe that it helps everyone feel a welcome at this great university and where everyone can thrive. And that is the academic mission of this university. I'm humbled by this opportunity and I look forward to working with the president, the regents, my fellow administrators and colleagues. And thank you for the opportunity to serve this university. Thank you, President Kaler and Dr. Goh. Uh, we move on in our agenda and building on the good work of uh, the Governance and Policy Committee, we have an opportunity, I believe, next to approve minutes in the new format that uh, we learned quite a bit about today. So I'd entertain a motion to approve those and amend if needed. Is there such a motion? So moved. Any seconds? Second. Very good. There's a couple seconds. All right. All in favor to approve the minutes as, uh, as you have them before you, signify with the sign of aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. President Kaler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to update the Board of Regents on the work taking place across our university system. And I have a slide show today. Skeeter and Molly will make that work. Good. Thank you. I want to begin by noting that we've had a number of celebrations across the system so far this fall. Three successful homecomings at Crookston, Morris, and the Twin Cities. The inauguration of Dr. Lori Carroll as Chancellor of the University of Minnesota, Rochester on September 21st, and UMD's homecoming will take place this Saturday. And here are some visuals from those events. If you'll walk through those, our home, uh, Morris homecoming, Crookston homecoming, a dramatically good picture of Chancellor Carroll and me. <laughs> good looking group. Omari is featured in the background even though he's not here. So the Cougars won 13 to 7. Uh, the inauguration was spectacular. Homecoming in Duluth and a Twin Cities homecoming that uh, really was a very special time to bring our community together to celebrate the value of the University of Minnesota. It was an honor to welcome Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page as homecoming Grand Marshal on the Twin Cities campus. Uh, that is not his hand with the perpendicular pinky, however, he waved with the other one. I thank Justice Page, the Office of Student Affairs and the University of Minnesota Alumni Association for excellent homecoming weekend, and I appreciate the chancellors and the staff on all of our campuses for their good work, and we wish the Bulldogs good luck this weekend as they work to remain undefeated uh, in football not in hockey. An element of homecoming <laughs> that is crucially important to Regent McMillan. <laughs> He's from Duluth, after all. 
Uh, student safety uh, remains a uh, key importance to us. Uh, and I ask our, our uh, folks uh, before homecoming uh, in the Office of Student Affairs to review safety guidelines and engage in outreach to students for homecoming, including situational awareness, alcohol consumption, and intervening in instances of sexual misconduct. I was very heartened, uh, speaking of student safety, that the University of Minnesota Interfraternity Council recently decided to ban hard alcohol at Twin Cities member fraternity houses and chapter events unless provided by a third party vendor, uh, effective immediately. We set some expectations for this group and our students stepped up. Engaging our alumni was a critical piece of making this policy change happen and I'm thankful that our alumni leaders get involved in these types of important issues. There's nothing more important than the safety of our students. The consequences of alcohol poisoning are real and deadly. So I applaud the decision and I'm committed to continuing to partner with fraternities, sororities, and other student groups to chart a safer path forward for our students. Another critical element of safety is the prevention of and response to sexual misconduct at the university. And I have some updates on those efforts as well. As a refresher, over 99% of our 24,000 employees completed mandatory training by the June 30 deadline and we're ensuring the rest complete training too. New employees are required to take the training within the first 30 days of work. And I'm happy to report that 94.3% of our first year students on the Twin Cities campus, freshmen and transfer students, have already completed the student training. We're continuing to push towards long lasting cultural change, which has been the goal since we started this work. We launched the first of a series of academic department workshops for deans, chairs, and department heads around sexual misconduct prevention, and over 200 university leaders participated. Last month, we launched an awareness campaign called It Ends Here, with student-focused messages centering on bystander intervention techniques. It's moving full speed ahead on the Duluth and Twin Cities campus, and Kirkston, Morris, and Rochester are adapting the campaigns. Mid-October, we will host an all-Greek It Ends Here kickoff with tailored training for our Twin Cities students in Greek life. Another essential element of campus climate is assuring all of our students are supported and equipped to thrive at our university. Several weeks ago, the University of Southern California's Race and Equity Center released a new report on how public institutions across the country support or fail to support their black students. Using federal data, the report measured four access and equity measures and developed a equity index score from zero to four to rank public universities' performance. The methodology uh, is not perfect, and I will spare you some of the details, but I will tell you that the Twin Cities, Duluth, and Morris campuses each earned an A in the study for black student to black faculty ratios. That puts us in the top 20% of public universities. Rochester earned an A in representation equity, percentage of black students at UMR equals the percentage of black 18 to 24 year olds in Minnesota. And finally, the state of Minnesota received a statewide equity index score of 1.94. Well, the University of Minnesota system's average score is 2.3. So on a four point scale, 2.3 is at best a solid C. And we don't want to be average, we want to do better uh, than that. And we continue to work to close our equity and achievement gaps. And Dr. Goh's installation is an important step forward in doing that and remind you that promoting equity and diversity is indeed everyone's every day. <laughs> so I began on a celebratory note and I'll conclude on one. First rankings, the Consortium of Social Science Associations just re released its ranking of federal social and behavioral science spending. The University of Minnesota is fourth in the nation, which is remarkable given that we are actually significantly smaller than many of our social science uh, department competitors uh, around the country. We have a number of anniversaries this year, the 150th anniversary of the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities campus, the 50 year anniversary of the libraries, and the 100th year anniversary of Boynton, 1918. 1918 Boynton was established in response to the flu epidemic of 1819. So if you need a reminder to get a flu shot, consider this your reminder. Thankful for the board's approval of the University of Minnesota UMP and Fairview Health Agreement on September 28th. And we've launched the next phase of the Driven to Discover campaign. And I'm gonna conclude, Mr. Chair, with a short, it's a five minute, 
uh, video that uh, I think you will think is remarkable. So if we can play that, please, that will conclude my remarks. The greatest advances made in science, I believe, have all been based on serendipity. 30 years ago, Governor Perpich wondered whether or not there was some way to restore Minnesota lakes to their prior luster as fishing destinations. My lab was working on cancer viruses and someone asked me whether or not I could help them with genetically engineering fish. And in the process, we found an element in fish that was resurrected to become a primary way of fighting cancer after a 14 million year genetic sleep. We call it Sleeping Beauty. I'm Perry Hackett, and this is the best Minnesota fishing story you've ever heard. At the beginning of the 21st century was the idea that it might be possible to reprogram a person's immune cells to be directed to attack and kill specific types of cancer. CAR T-cell therapies began using viruses to bring the DNA in. They were so efficacious that two therapies were approved by the FDA for the general population. The problem is that roughly only 10% of patients that would qualify for this therapy can actually get it. After we brought the Sleeping Beauty back to life, my colleague Scott McIver suggested that it could be used for non-viral gene therapy. Then Lawrence Cooper spent 10 years developing the Sleeping Beauty system to reprogram T cells. And that unlocked efficient human gene therapy that didn't involve viruses. No one had thought about that before we did it. The Sleeping Beauty transposon system has matched the results of the viral studies. And there are reasons to believe that Sleeping Beauty may be preferable not only for price and availability, but also for potential effects. I think you can think of um, biotechnology in particular as sort of two approaches. You can either take the approach where you want to hoard the technology and own everything, or you can take an abundance mentality view that as you share it and it'll have a broader impact. The University of Minnesota with the Sleeping Beauty Transposon took the view that the more people that used it, the greater the chance that it would have an impact in the world. And because of that combination of a technology and a visionary, in this case, Perry, really pushing that this could be something that could dramatically change a lot of people's lives. That origin led, led to a whole series of scientists and they're coming to Minnesota for that. And that secondary wave is now generating Minnesota as the destination for genome engineering because there's a cluster of entrepreneurship expertise. Globally, Minnesota has the highest density of genome engineering companies in the world. What we've been doing, especially the last 20 years, is building our toolbox, building the ability to manipulate and alter DNA. The goal is to master the skills just like you can with a word processor and change the code. We're trying to get to the one where we can do that same thing with DNA so that we can be able to customize those therapies based on what your health need is. And as we get better and better at being able to do this kind of editing, we're better and better able to make these kinds of custom therapies. And so it opens up an entirely new concept in how you're going to treat health, all because of Sleeping Beauty and, and Perry's vision to share. It's very important. Winston Churchill said that people go through life constantly stumbling over opportunities when they do. They pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and go right along. But in science, every now and then you see something that's a little bit unexpected, or someone asks you a question and it can redirect your whole scientific career. So if you stumble over opportunity, don't get up too fast. Look down and see what you stumbled across, because there might be something really important there.
Thank you. I think you ought to clap. Credit to uh, Ann Aronson and her team. Uh, that's a, an example of our new Driven to Discover um, publicity marketing campaign that we'll roll out uh, this fall. Uh, I can't resist a little bit of scientific uh, color commentary before I turn back over to you, uh, Regent McMillan. Uh, Jim Allison won half of the Nobel <clears throat> Prize in Medicine and Physiology uh, this year for his discovery of how to use T-cells uh, against cancer. And our very own Mark Jenkins, another pioneer uh, in the field of, uh, of T-cell uh, science, is one of your newest regents professors at the University of Minnesota. So with that, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Outstanding. Thank you, President Kaler. And uh, now for my report, I think uh, you've all become accustomed to me uh, trying to constantly uh, connect our agenda items back to the board priorities that, uh, that we outline and, uh, and agree upon each uh, summer. So I'm going to do that again because it helps ground me and hopefully helps uh, remind all of you that uh, we are focused on some overarching opportunities here and, and uh, recognizing those in the first is increasing private and public support for the university's mission. Last month, we had a great report from our co-chairs, John and Nancy Lindahl, of the Driven Campaign and our leadership at, uh, at the foundation. And uh, we saw how well that's going. And uh, by way of our consent report today, something that uh, we quite often drive by, if you will, um, recognize you should take a good hard look at it and understand that private gifts continue to uh, grow and support this university's mission. And on the public side of that, yesterday the Finance and Operations Committee voted to recommend approval of the university's biennial budget request and its 2019 capital request. And now we'll get to work having conversations with legislators about both those requests that are critical to serving the university's mission across this great state. Another priority, sustaining academic ex excellence across the system and driving our land-grant mission to access inclusion and student success uh, was, uh, was reflected in the Mission Fulfillment Committee's uh, yesterday conversation about disability services system-wide. Great and uh, extensive conversation with the board about the work of our disability services professional, professionals across the system and why that is so critical to ensuring access on all of our campuses for students, faculty, and staff, plus our visitors. And another priority, planning and executing a thoughtful and inclusive transition of presidential leadership. And since we last met in this room a month ago, the Presidential Search Advisory Committee's been hard at work, hosting listening sessions for students, staff, faculty, alumni, and community members on all of our campuses. They use the input collected during those listening sessions to shape the position profile, a 26-page document with important information about the position, embracing our core criteria and about the university. Regional Mari has also met individually and in small groups with elected officials, donors, and influential alumni to more informally gather that, uh, that input that we need. And I want to take a moment again to thank Regional Mari for his service as chair of our search advisory committee, as well as our own regents, Lucas and Swigum for making an enormous commitment of their time to this important effort. Our search consultants are now busy recruiting candidates, and we enter that phase, critically important phase of this work. And I'll remind everybody that nominations can be submitted at uh, president-search.umn.edu. That concludes my report. And uh, since there's no uh, items to receive and file, we can move right to the consent report, which I referenced a minute ago about gifts, and I'd entertain a motion from someone to so approve. I'll move it. Thank you. Second. Very good. Moved and seconded. All in favor of uh, accepting and approving the consent report signify so with the sign of aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. That item carries, which takes us into, sorry, uh, Regent Powell. Chair McMillan, thank you. Just before we move on to the next item of business, um, I just wanted to um, thank uh, President Kaler and his team for the lunch yesterday with first-generation students mm -hmm. and also the dinner last night. We 
as you went through all of the work that your team and Chair McMillan, all, everything we've been occupied in, we spend so much time on that stuff. We just, I know, all feel we never have quite enough time to do what we did yesterday. And I wanted to thank you for that event and the dinner last night with the Faculty Council. Both of those are highly appreciated. Chair McMillan, Regent Powell, thank you very much. We will continue to work to build more of those kind of high-quality, high-contact events into your schedule. So I appreciate the, uh, the shout-out. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Powell, and uh, for context for the audience, we, uh, we have packed a lot into our Thursdays, our committee meeting day, and as a board and with uh, President Kaler and uh, Director Steve's help, we're trying to make sure in the, in the effort to get our business done, we don't uh, forget about opportunities like Regent Powell's referencing an outstanding lunch with first-generation students and an outstanding dinner with the Faculty Consultative Committee whose chair I see sitting right before us. So thank you, Dr. Constant, as well. They hosted us last night, I believe. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, they did. <laughs> yes. With graciousness. Yes. All right, so uh, now we'll turn to an item on vision and planning for East Bank development. And uh, while uh, Vice President Bertelson and uh, Sarah Harris, the Managing Director of UMFREA, come forward, I'll, uh, I'll Turn this over to uh, to you, unless President Kaler, you have any opening remarks? I don't think you no, may. I, I, thank you, Chair McMillan. I was uh, temporarily distracted there. Uh, this is uh, a very important conversation here as uh, we begin to understand uh, our view of two things. One is is how do we develop and manage uh, development on the east on the east side uh, of our campus, and secondly, how we collaborate and cooperate. Uh, with the University of Minnesota Foundation, a, a separate entity at the end of the day, but a very important partner in so many ways. And so uh, I'm delighted to, uh, to welcome the speakers. Vice President Bertelson, are you beginning, or Director Harris? I imagine right. you figured this out. We did. I will All get right. to go first and Outstanding. get saved at the end. So uh, good morning. Last month in, when we presented the six-year capital plan, I talked briefly about the East Bank development planning on the east side of campus and how the university has been planning cooper cooperatively and collaboratively with the University Foundation Real Estate Advisors, who I will now refer to as UMFRIA, which is just a lot faster than all that, um, in order for us to create an integrated planning framework for this area of campus. Today, uh, Sarah Harris and I will be talking more about this work, um, but I want to emphasize this as we launch in, just like the presentations last month, that we are very early in our planning. Um, we don't need any decisions from you today. We are seeking your input, and we will be back again in the future with further updates and seeking further direction. So I just want to provide that context so you know there's not a, a wait for you at the end. Um, so I want to start with the end in mind. Um, what are the goals for the university and the development of this part of campus? Um, and even to start behind that, uh, I think that starts with what makes for a great university. Because whenever we think about land planning and development, we're thinking how can that piece, how can that planning and the physical built environment of the space help support the, a great research university. So we know there's pieces of that, faculty, students, and staff, but it also is donors, patients, alumni, we know it's things that the university can do, but it's not things that we can't do all things by ourselves. The university requires many partners. We require donors and alumni and the state and um, corporate partners. So how do we bring all those people into the university? Well, faculty, students, and corporations, entrepreneurs, they all have choices about where they want to be and who they want to partner with. To draw them and retain them, we believe that place matters and that many, we have many of those components that make them want to be here, but not all. And so to round out a more complete and balanced environment, we need to continue to diversify our campus area development. And that creates that space that people want to be that adds to all of these components you can see in the slide. Um, the university's focus in is core, is, focuses on our core of our teaching, research, and outreach but to create the rest of the environment, we need the private and nonprofit sectors to be part of our broader community. To what end? We believe that creating vibrancy and activity positively impacts the campus experience. And that we need to, we've heard clearly from organizations, 
whether they be corporate or nonprofit or government, that the spaces they want to choose for the locations they want to move their organizations are looking for this kind of experience. Like they're looking for the kind of place that their employees and their staff want to live and work and recreate mm -hmm. and be. So those are the kind of things we've seen it in many uh, large searches across the country. So how do we create the goods and services that include, are inclusive in the city building, great spaces to live and work and gather? How do we make it part of our recruitment and retention of our faculty and staff? How do we make sure that um, we are looking broadly about the kinds of needs of not just the things that we need, but the things our partners need and want to be, and to pick the space to be next to us? The university's role, we look ahead to make sure that we are planning both for current and future university program needs. Specifically in this area of campus, a major focus, as we talked about last month, is the future growth of the university's clinical campus and making sure that we are protecting enough space to deliver that vision. But we also want to enable in this development the way that we create the right balance between the, university, the use of university resources and private investments. We know that we don't have all the resources to build all of this ourselves and look to the, the appropriate uh, partnering with a private sector. So that's the what we want to achieve. Now I want to talk a little bit more about the how. Two years ago, um, we presented this, this very slide to the board talking specifically about what the roles were for um, acquisition of real estate purchases. The purpose of our conversation is more broad than that today. It's to talk about how do we begin at the um, very early in a planning of a future development state about what's needed to guide real estate investments and decisions and to help encourage development. We're doing that work now because um, though for many years this section of campus uh, along University to toward 280 was rather undeveloped, underdeveloped and uh, um, had a lot of space and was largely single story kind of buildings. We have seen now with light rail development, we are seeing that change dramatically and at a faster and faster pace. So we know that the time for us to develop, make sure we're thinking about this section of campus is now for us to do that planning because without us having a plan to influence that development, that decision, those decisions will be made for us and be made by others. And so there is a, there's an outcome, whether there's a plan or having no plan is still a plan. University planning and real estate office is driven by meeting the campus, thinking about what the campus, current campus boundaries are and ex future expected needs for campus expansion. UMFRIA serves to enhance the safety, viability, and vibrancy of the community surrounding the campus and how do we leverage the private sector near us. This slide represents the, in, again, was presented to the board in June of 2016 where the board reviewed and approved the campus development framework. It, identified a series of planning tools to look for the campus develop, for development, to give a direction to, to us as staff about the development of campus character, location, intensity, looking very long term over a 30 year time period. One of the things important to our development plans is to be clear about our goals and what gaps we have in that development. In this planning, we need to be clear about our intent and what we need to have on campus as well as what we want to have and encourage the private sector on the edge of campus. And so I just point out specifically points one and five, which I'll come back to later, is how do we advance outreach, our outreach mission, and how do we integrate the campus and our community edges? So I wanna talk about student housing for a moment uh, as an example of this sort of planning and how we find a balance between university investments and the private sector. The board has seen this chart before. It shows the university, how the university has managed housing and meeting the deliverables of the Board of Regents enrollment strategy that you adopted in March of 2016 that set an overall target for student enrollment for the campus. Using that en enrollment, the Board also identified targets for university service to set for what part of how that enrollment should be housed in housing that the university owns and manages and set targets of 90% of first year students, 20% of second year students, and 10% of transfers. The vertical lines represent the capacity of each of those types, the blue bars showing residence halls, primarily we focus for first years students, and yellow and orange bars showing apartment beds, yellow being facility, apartments the university owns, and orange representing master leases that we've used. 
You can see here that within this capacity, we have built and planned for capacity in excess of the board adopted enrollment goals for the targets of the enrollment. So as we, those, again, those challenges and targets for enrollment or those ratios may be changed by the board in the future, but at this time we have a, in our plan um, enough capacity for the university to meet the targets for housing for the enrollment strategy that's been set by the board. Another way to show that in other slides we've presented before is a, a timeline history of the growth of residence halls and versus apartments. And you can see from 2015 to the projected 2021, a growth of 13% in assignable beds over that six year time horizon or about 900 beds. Again, meeting, um, meeting the target for, and meeting and exceeding the target for the enrollment strategy as set by the board. In 2016, we mapped out and presented to the board the volume and kind of housing that is available to students near the Twin Cities campus, because we don't, the picture I showed you before, just the university owned and managed. But we think more broadly and pay attention to what is the market and where are our students living. So we know that this data isn't complete and doesn't have every bed. We don't represent all of the single family homes that are around, including Marcy Homes, where we know many of our students live. We know that 100% of these beds are not occupied by students, and we know that some students live at home and, and commute. But in 2016, 40%, 42% of the available housing near campus was nonprofit. That's the pink and orange rows, or the top five rows in the chart. The university focuses on residence halls, of course, for first year students, because we know it's important that first year of the transitions of students come on campus for their future success is that we provide the kind of support and guidance that's available in a residence hall setting. But it's also the kind of housing that the private sector doesn't build. They don't, not, they don't build and operate the res, sort of residence hall housing. They focus on uh, apartments, and which is 58% of provided by the private sector. So we can see that the private sector has responded to the change of interest of students who or have uh, the interest and style of what's, how students want to live and where they want to live has shifted in the more private market has helped respond to that. We can see that over time, starting back in 1989, the first of the private housing that was built. And you can see over the last five years, that interest and growth has um, dramatically increased. So almost 9,000 additional private apartment beds in the last five years near campus, and it has not stopped. Oh, that over the next five years, another uh, almost 5,000 um, private housing beds are anticipated. With the foundation, our joint planning for this area will focus on creating the environment and situation for the private sector to deliver not just the student housing, which is largely what we've seen. We've seen lots of the, the places for students to live and the private market responding to that and the kind of food service, uh, fast food things that are trying to respond to that but we see gaps in the kinds of development that fully round out the environment that we are looking for. And that's the work that we're doing um, with UMFRIA. When, so broadly, when I think about roles and responsibilities, the university itself thinks about from real estate, how to begin project the needs of the, our six year capital plan, looking ahead for master plans and looking for opportun opportunistically for when purchases become available for spaces that could meet, help to support that program. But, and, but it's not just us, UMFRI also has been looking ahead and anticipating the kind of spaces to protect the edge of campus so that we have space planfully to look for the kind of development that we would seek to enhance the university's mission. So partnerships in total really boil down to this, I think, that we believe there is an important role for partnerships in development and leveraging the private sector investment to support the university's future. We we can't do that all of ourselves. We believe that there's roles both for the kind of, uh, that the private sector wants to be the near the university, and we hear from them that they are interested uh, to make their programs more successful by being near our students and our faculty and the ideas that are generated from them. The university also benefits from that by access to internships and jobs for students, capital investments and capital in investments um, made for university researchers and the development of research ideas into new businesses, as well as partnerships with university um, initiatives. So why are we doing this together? Um, because we believe that the common, we need to have a common goal 
um, and integrated planning for us to think about the shared spaces, be it transportation, be it utilities, be it public spaces, that, into, that um, need to flow together and be seen across a series of developments that have the staying power over a long period of time. The university has done this planning and has been doing this in concert with conversations we are having, not just uh, with UMFREA, but with the neighborhoods as part of the university's neighborhood strategy that we want to have a be good neighbors with the city around us. And but also we're having conversations with the city and the county and the state about what their roles in that sort of uh, that infrastructure to help support this sort of space. So back to the map. Um, this again points to the area where we've been focusing our time, in it, where we have had growth in the biodiscovery district, the stadium, um, the clinical and surgery center. But we see the find opportunities to connect these spaces and with additional development on the east side of campus that looks for prioritizing the human scale density. It adds density and that will be important for the building the kind of spaces that we need to advance our goals here. And I'll end my part of the presentation with ending where, uh, ending where we, we were last month, with the map that shows the multiple sorts of spaces that, um, uh, and outline the kind of spaces. So we can, again, on the southeast corner in the pink, the clinical campus, the future clinical campus, and the northeast across from the stadium, and sort of the purple, um, university land interests of places of innovation and where the 2407 partnership is. And in the yellow in the middle, the space that the UMFRIA has been working on developing. And now I'll turn to Sarah Harris to talk to you more about that. Wonderful. Thank you. Regent McMillan, Regents, thank you for including me here today. And I think as our first visible sign of partnership, I'm going to ask you to do the buttons for I'm me. ready. This. Excellent. Um, I thought before I started talking about the joint planning that we're doing, it might be helpful if I gave you a quick overview on why I'm even here at the table. As Vice President Bertelson mentioned, UMFREA is part of the University Foundation. And we were created when Jim Cargill donated a large portfolio of real estate to the foundation. It sits on the eastern edge of campus and it's largely student housing. In fact, it was some of the first apartment style student housing built in this area. It not only allowed us to continue to support students as they pursued their academic careers, it also gave us a financial platform from which we could do more for the university using our real estate expertise. And that has taken on various forms over the last five years, including things like uh, helping to advance a university priority around the safety of Greek chapter homes. We helped to design and now we underwrite and service the loan program that has been used so far by six houses, and we close on another loan later this month, all towards improving those homes. So those are the kinds of things that we can bring our real estate expertise to bear on, on behalf of the university. Beyond that advisory kind of work, we also are, as Vice President Bertelson mentioned, focused on the surrounding area. While it isn't owned by the university and it doesn't necessarily contain uh, the spaces that deliver the direct uh, academic research or outreach mission of the university. It is entirely tied to the uh, future of this place-based institution. When students or patients or uh, visitors are in a facility, they don't care if it's university owned or if it's in the surrounding area. It's all part of the experience that they feel when they feel they are on campus. And so that's why we are very focused on this. Next slide, thank you. Um, this focus uh, is uh, because we are part of the foundation, that not only keeps us connected missionally to the university, but it also allows us to bring that real estate expertise to the foundation and to the university. And you can see a list of folks here that serve on our advisory council and on our governance board, and they provide not only a love for this institution, but they also uh, by themselves bring forward significant business and real estate expertise that is available to us and ultimately to the university. So moving into the planning that we're doing, the first thing that we did was to start focusing on best practices from around the country. We traveled to some 15 different cities, oftentimes with leaders from the university joining us. We wanted to talk to our peers at institutions across the country about why they were focused on the surrounding areas, what they did to integrate with those surrounding areas, and what they learned from that. 
And I have just a sampling of those cities here on the slide, and you'll notice that each of these institutions were focused on a variety of things that were important to them for the surrounding areas. Mayo Clinic wants to make sure that Rochester is a compelling place for their patients and for their talent. Uh, University of Chicago needed a commercial area that would not only support their students and their faculty, but would also provide a place for businesses to land and become research partners with that institution. The University of Wisconsin at Madison was very concerned about the safety of their students as they tried to activate their campus, and so they were focused on how to activate. University of Pennsylvania in Drexel had a very tragic incident occur about two blocks off campus, and that caused them to uh, focus on making sure that the entirety of their campus and all of the surrounds were safe, and, and so they uh, entered into uh, agreements with the private sector on commercial and residential development surrounding their campus. Stanford was interested in creating a sustainable campus in keeping with their curriculum and research engine. And MIT uh, was very focused on how they could further leverage the private sector partnerships that they had in the areas of innovation. I would suggest to you that because of the breadth and depth of the university campus, each and every one of these things applies to us here. And we are very focused on how all of these things can occur in our surrounding area. The other interesting thing we learned from these cities is that they were all done in partnership with the private sector. Not only did the private sector bring forward the expertise to do the development and the networks to bring the businesses in, they also brought forward their private capital in order to allow these institutions to preserve their capital for their institutional <laughs> specific infrastructure and facilities. So the partnership was necessary in, in all of the cases that we looked at. The other thing we learned when we went to these other cities is that we're lagging behind. Um, as this pie chart shows on the left, um, we need to be completing all of the different kinds of uses that are here to make this a complete environment for our students, for our faculty, for our patients, for everybody that visits this campus. We need to have a broader spectrum of housing so that if a faculty member and their family wanted to live here, there would be a place for them. We need office space so that when a corporate research partner or a young entrepreneur wants to live or office adjacent to the university, there is a place for them. We need to have some uh, maker space, which I see is not showing up on the pie chart, but that orange wedge should say maker space. So think students, think researchers, where can they incubate their businesses next to campus? And of course, we need the activated public realm that ties it all together. And presently, because there hasn't been a comprehensive plan that's working with the private sector, each building has only been built in a building property by property basis and nothing has allowed it to come together. And the benefit of our joint planning really uh, allows us to start pulling this together. The need for this kind of activated space, as Vice President Bertelson mentioned um, earlier, has been confirmed time and time again when we're talking to folks about what it takes to locate next to the university and are we ready. And what we have heard is that the environment doesn't yet contain what it would take for them to attract their talent and come and locate <laughs> next to the university. It's important to note um, that the U can't do this by itself. The university, and rightfully so, is using its public resources and its balance sheet to focus on its specific facilities and infrastructure. The private sector isn't yet ready to complete the pie chart that you see here because, in part, the first phase of development will need to help prove that the market is here. And so the foundation is stepping in to bridge the needs of the university to the private sector and help this activity to happen. All right, now we're ready to go to the next one, thanks. So as mentioned earlier, we have been focused on acquisition in this area. And to orient you on this slide, you can see McNamara <coughs> Alumni Center and TCF Stadium at the top. And you can see the clinic and surgery center identified with the CSC at the bottom of the slide. To give you a sense of scale, the properties contained within that dark gray border represent roughly 20 blocks. And within those 20 blocks, we, through uh, the university and the foundation, control all the parcels that are in varying shades of gold. The city controls two small parcels that are shown in pink, and all of the uh, remaining parcels in blue continue in private control. What's important about this is because we have been collectively focused on acquisition over the last five years or so, we now control enough that we can actually do a joint plan together and we can execute on the development framework for this area. In many cases, our acquisitions of these sites 
were done in a way where we were matching uh, third-party offers for these sites. Had we not been able to match those offers and acquire these sites, we wouldn't be talking about completing our development framework. We would instead be looking at 30-story towers of student housing being, going, uh, being developed as we speak on some of these sites. And our opportunity to really drive what happens here would be lost. And it would be happening to us rather than allowing us to guide the activity. So as we're doing the joint planning, one of the first things that we did was focus on the principles for placemaking in this area. We worked together on what strong placemaking principles are that not only are in keeping with all of the university's plans, but that are core to any great city in the, in the uh, country or in the world. Things like safe and walkable places, active spaces, good connections that can allow us to connect between key buildings and landmarks, and those types of things that we can do because we control enough of the area and we can look at a large enough area that we can think about it in a district-wide plan rather than property by property. This place will need to be vibrant both day and night and during the winter and summer because this is, these are the principles that are key to safety. These are the principles that are key to attracting talent. And these are the principles that are key to supporting our student medical and research enterprise on this edge of the campus. So we're early in our planning process, um, and this is just a, a diagram to show you how we're starting to think about the area. First, how does the public realm work? We're starting to talk about how we can better connect the existing and future investments and solve for some of the area's weaknesses, like intersections that aren't working well. I'm sure we can all imagine what some of those might be. Um, we're starting to talk about things like how can we make assets in the area better connect to the university, like the Mississippi <coughs> River, by way of example. We're focusing on how the overall system works, regardless of how you arrive here, by which mode of tra transit, and also regardless of which direction you're coming from. And we're thinking about all of this because we need to better connect students on campus to the neighborhood. We need to connect patients to spaces where they can restore and reflect. We need to connect fans to places where they can gather for future celebrations, like, I don't know, perhaps a Rose Bowl victory or near and dear to my heart, a basketball or NCAA volleyball championship, right? So those things need places to happen on campus, and that's what's leading our planning effort at the moment. We're also starting to think about things like the public realm, connections, building scale, and placement. And to do that, we are once again looking at our peers around the country. I've thrown in just a few examples of how public realm can work, like this example, which is South Lake Union in Seattle. We're thinking about how do we uh, connect our research institution in a way that allows private sector enterprise to locate right next to us. And for that, we're looking at places like Kendall Square adjacent to MIT in Boston. And we're looking at many, many others, too many to talk about today. At the same time, we're also thinking about how uses need to be placed in this area. We're taking the development framework that was approved in 2016 and we're starting to refine it based on where those uses want to be. Where do innovators and research partners want to locate next to the university? Where do patients want to be and their families? Where do those uh, game day attendees want to be? Where do they want to eat? Where do they want to cross paths with students? All of those types of things are starting to inform how we think about this place. And while this is still a very much mutual work in progress, it starts to signal how we're thinking about placement of uses in the area. At the same time, we're also starting to curate conversations with university researchers, artists, and others to talk about how we can take the good work that they are doing and demonstrate it in this place. That not only gives them an opportunity to prototype their work, but it can become a billboard for the great things that are happening here at the university for the entire public and the entire world to see. We're also starting conversations with respective users. We're talking to corporate research partners, to innovators, to residents, to donors, to alumni, and we're asking them what would it take for them to be part of this compelling place that will make it dynamic and in turn will make the university that much stronger and the state stronger in the process. So before I hand this back to Vice President Bertelson to talk about when we will be back with more direction on program and planning and other things, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for your time and for your input. It's that very input that will make our planning and ultimately this place on the edge of campus that much better. So thank you. So next steps, 
um, work we're doing, we'll be continuing to work on the completion of this project area planning in partnership with um, Sarah and Umfria and um, the planning team that they've put together. We'll continue to do advocacy for the larger area and the long-term planning. That's conversations we're having with the city of Minneapolis. Will be conversations with the county and with the state. It'll be about continued planning as uh, you, the six-year plan that you've adopted gives us a hefty lift and a lot of work to do to start planning for the next work that needs to advance the health sciences and the facilities that they need. So those are the things that we're working on long-term, how we advance this partnership and how we, um, what the next steps and any decision that we would need to bring back to you will be in the coming months. I don't have exact date for you yet. Uh, planning is a directional issue and uh, um, we, but we do hope that it will be in the not years ahead, but just in months ahead. So with that, I think we will um, uh, sit for questions. Very good. I have a couple thoughts, but why don't we get started with, uh, with uh, Regent views, and we'll start with uh, Regent uh, views and questions. Regent Beeson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much, presenters. I um, strongly support this from both a strategic and financial standpoint, but it, you know, this is very different and I think it does make some of our colleagues uh, nervous and it, it should because this is a, uh, this is a speculative business that we're embarking on and have been in the last few years since we bought the days in uh, and uh, uh, real estate requires quick decisions to uh, uh, and without um, knowing exactly what the financial outcome is going to be. But I can tell you this, that uh, having worked in this area for 30 years and working with developers, that they will build up to the edge of campus. They'll build right up to the mall of Northrop, and they will build 30-story towers like you're seeing over on Harvard mm -hmm. and Washington. Mm -hmm. So unless we want to control our borders and have something other than a concrete jungle, that we need to do this sort of work. And it's so it's both so it's defensive in one way, um, but it also gives us some additional land. And it, it, it makes better the planning that we're you're embarking with uh, on Mr. Burleson on the Academic Health Center. Gives you a little more land to look at working mm -hmm. with uh, the idea of some green space there. I agree, Regent Rosha needs some green space over at the Academic Health side, the other side of uh, Oak Street too. Um, Having said all that, we have to have a partner, though. We, this public-private notion is, is the way to go. Uh, it has to be a trusted partner, and we do trust it. It's an exceptional friend of the university. We can't develop this on our own. We don't have the, we don't have the networks. We don't have the expertise. Um, <clears throat> and so I like the fact that we've got a developer that we can work with on this. And, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Regent Beeson, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair McMillan. I cannot say how impressed I am with how far you've taken this. Um, my involvement in this topic started back when I was in the foundation board prior to becoming a regent. And uh, Steve Goldstein at that time wanted us to look at best practices for urban campuses. And that, that uh, was started at that time, and it was very interesting. I also belonged to the Real Estate Advisory Board, so I saw it from both sides. But when I came to the Regents, uh, I could only observe all the, all the activity that has gone on, and I can't compliment you enough for bringing it this far, and I think the two of you deserve our deepest thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Lucas. Uh, Regent Powell. Um, thanks, uh, Chairman Millen, and thank you, um, Vice President Bertelson and Director Harris. Um, and, and I also, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, we, we, we need a plan. And I, and this is the fourth time you've taken me through this now. Uh, I started late, and another four, and I think we'll be home and dry. But I'm, I think I'm starting to, I'm, I'm starting to understand it a, a little bit. I, I think of it as a commercial center that we're developing. I mean, the university has different, there's academic centers and health, and this, I think of this as, as largely, a, um, you know, developing in a plantful way, a commercial center for the, for the campus that includes 
storefronts and office and patient experience and this sort of thing. It may not be perfect, but I'm, and the reason I'm saying that is because um, uh, Director Harris, as, as we've talked before, given the assets that the foundation is going to put into this uh, and the university, you know, uh, real estate um, that's worth a lot. That's worth a lot of money. One of the questions I have, and and really I think it should be um, a priority, and it's a key university interest here, is how do we, as we build this out, how do we create um, a revenue stream? For for the university because there's because there's value here and and I think you know I think the idea of offering you know of, of housing businesses and is, is positive and the opportunity to have a much more flourishing commercial sector all of this is really good but it should be generating an income stream and I'm interested in um, as we do these public privates uh, how are we going to make sure that we are uh, you know in a, a strong enough position with those partnerships and I'm totally open to public private I frankly I'm I don't think we can do it without it, but how do we make sure that we have enough control over those so that part of the vision of this is that we're translating this highly valuable real estate and access to you know, our, our campus community into a really positive and ongoing revenue stream for the university. And for, for me, that's, that's going to be an, a very important piece of the puzzle here going forward. Thank you, Regent Powell. Uh, which of you wants to? Tackle um, revenue streams. Um, um, Mr. Chair, Regent Powell, I, um, maybe just one thought on that. I, I appreciate the feedback. And I think, uh, I just, uh, I guess I would encourage us to think about two sorts of impacts for revenue and what this can do back for us. The, and it will have to be a balance that we'll have to determine in the, mix, in the mix. We could develop in one way to maximize return, um, which may be one kind of development. Um, but a different kind of development that has maybe more of a focus on the community building um, may be leading to a different kind of payback that won't be specifically a real estate return. So if it enables us to better recruit corporate partners on the innovation corridor, that may help drive uh, private funds into our research program, which is a, adding to the university's resource stream and diversifying a sense of our support beyond just the state and NIH, um, which is an important kind of contr contribution. So I'm with you, but it just has to have a return. And we just have to be, think real clearly about what are the kinds of return. Does it help us attract partners, attract private research dollars, attract um, spaces for uh, jobs and internships? Um, some of those returns will be specifically from the real estate and others will be more um, incidental, but things, still things we're going to have to track. I don't know if you have anything. Director Harris? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, please. No, sorry. Go ahead. Well, uh, Chair, with you. Yes, uh, Regent so, Powell. So um, I, I'm, I appreciate that there are different kinds of return and I, and I uh, am supportive of the idea that there are multiple uh, Objectives for the plan. I, I, agree. I mean, I, safety and neighborhood vibrancy, and that, and, and that those objectives would would probably have us leaning away from certain kinds of development uh, that, that could be in the short term, you know, more lucrative financially. So I personally, mm -hmm. I uh, accept all that. That's why we want to plan. Mm -hmm. That's why we want to have a plan. Having said all of that, though, private um, private investors are going to will want to uh, partner with us. I think because because there's an opportunity to 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 get a return, you know, having and there's a good business proposition, which is fine. But I just want to, you know, I mean, if they don't see, uh, if they don't see uh, a return on investment, they're not going to come into this. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that as we, you know, go down that path, we are sharing in that financial return, and that we're not really ceding, you know, the, the you know, the the, the the property value that we have, and, and to the majority of that to whoever our financial partner is. I just want to make sure that we're sharing that. Mm -hmm. I might uh, translate or further add to that and capture some other input I've gotten from board members as we as a board are probably as interested, if not considerably more interested in the underlying structure of the deal, the business uh, framework as we are in what the you know what the various things may look like, whether it's five stories, fourteen stories or uh, you know, an acre too that uh, is all of interest to us. But you've got, uh, I think, if I if I can fairly characterize some of the feedback I've picked up, that is 
really critical and uh, the next step would be then coming back with those business models and uh, frameworks and and uh, what's the underpinning so I don't ever need to put words in Regent Powell's mouth but I've heard it from others too so I just add to it. Director Harris your opportunity to uh, reply to to uh, what uh, Regent Powell raised. Chair Regent Powell thank you and I, I don't have much to add other than I do think it's a combination of sources that we need to be looking at and how we quantify some of the qualitative benefits that we need to be getting out of this project will also be what we expect of the development community and bring their capital to those issues as well. So I would look forward to working with all of you on identifying how we measure success so that we can identify the right revenue streams as a result. Good, thank you. Regent Simonson. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, <clears throat> You know, I have to remind myself daily to live one day at a time, but I think long-range planning is critical, too, so I really appreciate what you've done. I've kind of um, asked this question before, but it, uh, uh, I'd like to bring it up again. As far as the startups and the incubator space, uh, and I really appreciate that. I mean, economic development in Minnesota, I think, is critical, and I think that opportunity is there. But how are you going to determine that need and opportunity, what kind of space? You talked about the St. Paul campus a while back, doing the same thing, and now we're talking East Bank. How are you gonna calculate the need there? And um, Mr. Chair, Vice President um, Bertelson, Regent Simonson, I think um, that's a good question and one we're still working on is probably the best answer. Um, the, um, we are having conversations, I mean, before, uh, uh, related to this from the 2407 conversation on the day's insight, we have had a lot of conversation with corporate um, folks and one of the advantages of working through the foundation is that they are um, enter into those conversations um, oftentimes at a different level and a place um, in those organizations that leads to different kind of conversations from leaders at a, a very senior level as opposed to maybe university services would maybe talk to somebody in the real estate department you get a very different perspective and an interest in those conversations. And so I think that's one of the benefits of this partnership. Um, second is I think one of the conversations with, you know, again, focusing from the 24-7 is I think, um, as opposed to just looking at um, a startup building, um, we're looking at, I think, more than that, a place where there is a mix of both um, pieces of the corporate, large existing corporate structures or, and then medium-sized places that are in transition and still spaces um, earlier on in that process. You know, so I think we have to look at the whole array and one of the things that's um, sort of in my mind to try to understand better is um, how do we, the whole pathway from existing lab and NIH funding and all the steps between here before you get to that large final kind of a corporate setting. We have pieces of that in place with the uh, UEL, um, you know, further down the campus, but that's a that's in that continuum. But we still have spaces and gaps, and that's what I'm hearing from um, some of the startups and some from our existing faculty is where do we help we how do we find those that pathway all the way through? Um, so those are the series of conversations. I don't have a specific answer for how we're going to address that. I think to your point about St. Paul versus Minneapolis. Um, we are trying to figure out how to differentiate which kinds of activities would make sense in different places. You know, here I think is maybe more of a health focus. You know, that's why we think about the ties to where the clinical campus could be. What does that mean for clinical research? And how does that then translate to the next step? And so there's a, the, the, peop, the units we're um, talking to here, at least one of the themes I think would be a health theme, whereas St. Paul is maybe more of a environmental, agriculture, bio, bio themes. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay. Follow up, Regent Simonson, or are you good? All right, Regent uh, Rocha. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good conversation today. I, I think that this is really, it's good timing. Um, as, as we know, in, in the past, it was, we've gone from periods of acquisition as an institution where we buy anything that's available to positions where we're sort of hands off and you don't acquire unless you absolutely have an identified need at that point. Um, and when you when you think about it, when you see the examples of some of these other communities, some of which I think were driven more by the private sector, just kind of identifying and ask, you know, sort of the relationship and, and developing it. And some I think where the institutions were more involved. Um, you know, you look at 
you know, um, obviously around the St. Paul campus, you look at Marcy Holmes, the Marcy Holmes neighborhood, that a lot has kind of just developed on its own. And in, in fact, we've, on a housing basis, have been the beneficiary where we've now entered into some leasing arrangements where the private sector had placed some housing in place. But as we are going through our um, strategic uh, visioning as a board and putting together some planning on our side and, and identifying what those needs are, this is really coming together, I think, at a nice time. Um, that will give us the ability to take that developing uh, understanding along with the assets that, that um, um, Freya is, is putting together. And, and so I'm looking forward to uh, us being more active and sort of having an impact on that environment. I know this is sort of a 10,000 foot um, uh, statement, but um, I think it does, it does offer us some real opportunity um, to uh, to have more of an impact on our surroundings, which is especially important when you're a, a, an urban campus like we are. And so just having seen this over so many years, um, I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes and looking forward to a collaborative conversation and how we get there. Thank you. Thank you, Regent Rosha. Any responsive thoughts? Good input. Regent Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair McMillan. So it's really interesting to me to see what's, what's happening here. Um, I've been the private side of partnerships with private partner, private public partnerships, and now I'm sitting on the, the table being the public. And, and I, I can assure uh, Regent Paul doesn't, he, he knows this, but there, there's great things for both, you know, where two, a private and a, a public are, can come together and have, create a greater good depending on how they do that. Um, I think both bring assets to the table. I think it's important because somebody's going to be sitting in my chair 10 years from now or 20 years from now or some of this is coming to fruition. I think you're doing this, but I think it's, it's important to keep a wide latitude in what you're doing so that the people who are sitting around here 10 or 20 years from now have options to consider. I, th I think that's being done. Um, you know, I, I represent the board on, on the debt management committee, and I, I think it's, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, prior to doing that, the region who preceded me uh, from my district was Region Allen, and he always said his, his deal was, Tom, when you're on that debt management deal, make sure we have dry powder so we can do things as we need. And, and we discussed things, you know, the university's balance sheet, we're probably only using 65% roughly of our debt capacity. And um, I think these public-private par partnerships can really help us preserve that debt capacity or academic buildings and things like that. So I think it's great. Um, so partners can preserve the balance sheet. My last point is I, I just wanted to say that for-profit partners, we, we talked a little about this yesterday um, in, in discussion about levers we have at the university. From my perspective, for-profit partners can drive innovation and they can also bring efficiencies to operations simply because there is a profit motive where some of us in the public partnership, in the public realm do not have the profit motorship. Uh, and and I, think, I think that's good for us. I think it's good to have, we have to find the right partners. They gotta be right. They gotta have university interest in mind, but they're gonna wanna make money and they're gonna drive efficiencies that should be best for all of us. So I don't need any comments, but that's, that's my comments. Good. Thank you, uh, Regent Anderson. So, again, in the spirit of trying to uh, capture and and distill and and uh, feedback for you and your leaders, um, this Regent Paul used the term commercial center, and uh, I think that's a good way to, in a short sense, capture what it is you're about. It feels like urban redevelopment in many ways, and Director Harris, you've, you've been doing that your whole life. We've got regents here that, that are good at that too, and, and I think when I think about it in that context, it, it makes a lot of sense, but that word context uh, is so important, and I don't want to end this conversation without recognizing something that a couple of regents have also recognized, and that is it's great to see you all working together. One of the challenges with the board that you know, constantly evolves and turns over is that there's three people here that have been here longer than me, but I'm coming into seven and a half years, and I can remember a time when there wasn't that nice working relationship. 
and that's happening and that needs to be recognized and understood but there's also a couple regions that you know have six to a year and a half six months to a year and a half of time and I just implore you to keep pushing context and the two most important contextual slides you had up one is that enrollment and housing piece which is that histogram that shows where we're going is that the right word for that a histogram that's very good that sounded scientific didn't it a histogram um, that's a great whether it's the right plan or not, it's where the board is now. And if that if that's part of all of your conversations and then the 2016 development framework, which I really appreciate the way you describe that, you know, is another key piece of context that no matter how this board keeps evolving and changing, you can always bring it back to that. And then at some point the board may change it, you may change it, but it really helps us all land in a spot no matter when we when we came, and the last thing from uh, Director Harris from um, FRIAs, our UMFREA standpoint, this report, the Real Estate Revisors Annual Report, is an excellent piece of context about where, how, and why your organization exists and how it's led and governed and how you get private sector expertise. So all that's helpful to me, and uh, I, again, um, would leave you with this last thought. I think a good advance sense as you begin to get to something more concrete in terms of what the public partner, public private partnership might look like. The board's interested, you heard revenue, you heard the financial pieces, but underpinning all that is governance and control of what those organizations look like. And uh, as you start to come towards over the horizon seeing a deal materialize, the more advanced sense we get of what the governance and control looks like, that this is going to be a really good and positive conversation. And I, I don't know if I've embodied what I heard from the from my colleagues, but good stuff. Uh, so before we move on, Regent Beeson, I'm happy if anybody, if I got something wrong there, feed it back to me too, board members. Regent Beeson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think that's a, I, I, that's a, that's a strong summary statement. I, maybe to put a finer point on Regent Powell's vision of this sort of beyond a commercial center it's really an innovation and that's pretty better you know however we want to define it but it has to it has to be it has to tie into our core mission here even if we're not doing the work out of those buildings and we need to it needs to tie to our research and somewhat you know not 100 percent of the building but but uh and there's an incubator piece that's really intriguing along with bigger corporations, they want to locate innovation departments for their millennial employees, and they have been crowded out by the developers, mm -hmm. housing developers, because the housing developers overpay. Companies are not, you know, they're not aggressive enough that they have been able to get their own property. Thank you both. Great material, and uh, thanks for the, uh, the update and the advanced look. That takes us to... Uh, strategic priorities and last month we heard from uh, President Kaler about system-wide strategic priorities for 1819 and uh, Vice President Kramer is here today to talk with us about one of those priorities system-wide communications and uh, President Kaler would you lead us in thank you chair McMillan uh, as we talked about in September as you mentioned we are moving forward with system-wide strategic priorities that will make an impact over this academic year today we'll brief you on our efforts to optimize marketing and communications across the system and our years-long system-wide strategic planning process identified this as a major area for us to explore in order to enhance and amplify the U of M reputation and brand, to leverage our collective strengths across the system, and importantly, to reduce duplication. So with that, uh, I request we give the floor to Matt Kramer, Vice President for University Relations. Very good. Vice President Kramer. Mr. Chair, members, thank you. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. What I'm going to do is just give you a very high-level update. Uh, I would have brought better visuals, but the president stole the literally the best part of the Driven to Discover campaign launch, although I am told from Regent Chu that if regents don't know this, the music at the very end was written by and performed by the Minnesota Marching Band, and I believe Regent Chu, as a former tuba player, has offered to put a regent perspective on music <laughs> in the future. Uh, 
Regents, uh, very quickly, we are in the midst of rolling out a style guide. As visuals would be, this would be incredibly boring. Think of it as a phone book or an instruction book for all of our communicators system-wide. As part of the system framework that was adopted in 2017, it was identified that we very much needed <coughs> system guidelines in terms of how we talk about ourselves. And very briefly, I can give you an example that just jumps out all the time. If you're in the Twin Cities campus, whether you're a member of the University of Minnesota, staff, faculty, student, or you're the media, we have created a culture over a long period of time where we refer to the Twin Cities campus as the University of Minnesota. And we put a qualifier on everybody else. We say the University of Minnesota Morris or Rochester or Duluth. The reality is we are the University of Minnesota and our impact is statewide. So something as simple as from a style guide, making sure that we always refer to ourselves as the University of Minnesota. And if we're talking about the Twin Cities campus, we will introduce the qualifier, the Twin Cities campus. The style guide also has standard colors, maroon and gold. You would be surprised, uh, Regents. Over time, people, uh, the, the proliferation of Photoshop has allowed all of us to become marketing geniuses. And over time, people choose the wrong colors. Um, I've more than once seen Iowa State red showing up where maroon should have been. Uh, we are also announcing a system-wide landing page that will uh, roll out just after the first of the year. Again, as part of the system framework, today, all the information about the system actually resides on the Twin Cities webpage. We have this remarkable opportunity to educate outsiders about the University of Minnesota that President Kaler is not just the, think of him as the chancellor of the Twin Cities campus, but he is the president of the system. When we unintentionally lump the two together, the system gets lost and the Twin Cities dominates. By having a system landing page that allows us to talk about the breadth and scope of our operations, not just the campuses, but leveraging the discussion about extension, as well as piggybacking on some of the work that, uh, and I apologize, I forget his exact title, but Bob McMaster's uh, presentation on system-wide enrollment, having one page that we bring new high school students to where perhaps they look for the degree that they want or the type of campus they want versus automatically just always bringing them to the Twin Cities webpage. So there's a wonderful opportunity here to broaden the visibility and scope of the entire system. Recently, we've launched a number of new tools for communicators across the entire system. This includes a new individual within our department who concentrates exclusively on greater Minnesota media. That is both radio, in some rare cases TV, but primarily newspaper. And it's a very different market for us than the Twin Cities. In many, many cases, and you may have heard me say this in the past, the publisher, editor, reporter, and photographer at a small town newspaper might all be the same person. And so treating that person in the same way that we interact with the Minneapolis Star Tribune or the St. Paul Pioneer Press or any of the t local media outlets here in the Twin Cities does them a disservice. They may be interested in the content, but they truly are not able to use it because we're not giving it to them in digestible format that allows them to leverage the fact that they are multitasking to take something they're interested and put it in their local paper. We've had a great deal of success already using, in some cases, regions in this room, and I particularly call out Region Simonson with the Worthington Daily Globe, covering the University of Minnesota in part due to his status as a region, but finding ways to work University of Minnesota content into greater Minnesota publications. This year, we redid our research briefs, but we also introduced expert alerts. Research briefs take University of Minnesota researchers, and we time these research briefs for when the research is going to be published, typically in, a, in an academia publication. We time the research brief to highlight the nature of the research, and very much, you see this in the Driven to Discover campaign, how that research applies to Minnesotans. So this is a, um, a process where we look at all research, and not all research has a direct, immediate, or obvious tie to our fellow citizens. That doesn't mean we ignore it, but we're absolutely concentrating on research that demonstrates that the University of Minnesota benefits all Minnesotans. Expert alerts are generated by our office and by communicators system-wide, and they see something in the news. There is a timely event happening. For example, if we had a hurricane expert, now would be exactly the time to introduce that hurricane expert to the media and say, if you're covering the damage down on the Gulf Coast or in the panhandle of Florida, please contact researcher X and he or she might be an expert and is available for comments. Timely or expert alerts are those things that we can take advantage of moments in the news. And you'll see the statistics I've listed in your briefing. We're having a great deal of success with both of those. One of the things we've introduced as we looked at them is we don't just talk about the researcher or the, re or the expert. We actually provide what is called a pull quote. 
And so, again, when you think of many publications, they may be under a time deadline or they may have an opportunity to want to talk to that person, but they just can't at that moment. By giving them a quote from the researcher already pre-written, they're able to take this expert alert or research brief and now attribute it to the University of Minnesota without ever actually talking to the person. That gives them a way to accelerate placement of media. Um, I'm sorry, it gives us a way to accelerate placement of earned media. Finally, I had mentioned in a previous presentation, we're launching a survey of all communicators on the nature of training they desire. This is everything from professional development to industry trends. We already meet every other month as a communicators forum system-wide with people dialing in who aren't here in the Twin Cities, but that's not enough. It needs to be rigorous. It needs to be, think of it almost as certified in the sense that whether we're doing the training ourselves through our department or through other experts here at the University of Minnesota, anywhere in the system, or bringing in outside speakers, they're meeting a particular demand. This is a new initiative for university relations and internal to us, we're starting with a survey, understand what people desire, and then I'll figure out through our budget how we're going to provide that, perhaps reducing services in some areas and accelerating services in others. Finally, we, the president had shown you the uh, four minute video on uh, Driven to Discover. You may have seen these uh, ad placements already. It started on October 1st. They're on the evening news, they're in radio, they're in uh, e or TV, radio, print publications, wide variety of print publications, and they're also on digital media across the state. This is not a campaign though, however, where we launch it and then just sit back and watch. I give you my promise and commitment that I will be more than prepared at a future meeting, given that we've only launched the campaign 12 days ago, to report back on metrics as to how we're doing. And you'll be pleased to know that very much in the scientific nature of marketing, we are doing what is called A-B testing. You can't do this in TV, but we can do it on our digital media. We give users in digital publications and we're showing them an ad, so to speak, driven to discover, we give them two choices in two different images that link to the same thing. So like the Perry Hackett video that you saw on Sleeping Beauty, one of them might just show, for sake of argument, Sleeping Beauty, a fish. The other one shows Perry Hackett, which speaking just as somebody with a little bit of marketing expertise, he fits the goal of looking as close to Santa Claus as you can get without actually being Santa Claus. He's got a remarkable just face that draws people in. And our A-B testing has already demonstrated that users click on his face significantly more than if we just tell them Sleeping Beauty is about curing cancer. So we're doing that regularly so that we can change our digital media mix to reward those things that are important to users. On the Driven to Discover campaign, last week the American Association of Universities highlighted it in their blog to all of their members. And yesterday you heard Dean Lanyon talking about graduate schools, talking about why graduate students select the University of Minnesota. And two statistics jumped out. One of them related to the program and the efficacy and reputation of the program. But Dean Lanyon mentioned that 54% of our graduate students select the University of Minnesota on the basis of our reputation. And Driven to Discover is one of those mechanisms by which we build reputation. Mr. Chair, members, I'm happy to take any questions. Very good, thank you, Vice President Kramer. Um, has uh, adding white facial hair done anything for my credibility? <laughs> Don't answer that. I'm gonna to go to Regent Simonson for the first question, so. Thank you, Chair McMillan. And I really appreciate that uh, system-wide enrollment, system-wide strategic plan that you're talking about. As I'm onboarding, traveling to different campuses, um, I don't sense that, and so I really appreciate that focus because uh, I think it's, it's needed. We're one university with five campuses. So uh, the other thing we've had a lot of conversation about is, is uh, diversity. Uh, and, uh, and I, too, appreciate President Kaler. I guess he left uh, the dinner last night. Most of the uh, first-generation stu uh, students uh, uh, at the table I sat at were uh, first-generation from outside the U.S., and you look at, you mentioned Worthington, where we have uh, 52 different dialects, 60% of the uh, kids in grade school are uh, English second language, and reaching out to them in some special way to help them connect to the university, uh, and it could be through, I don't know, special scholarships, some other things that we could do to uh, attract them to our university. Doesn't necessarily mean here, but all the campuses, I'd really like to ask you to be thinking about that. Vice President Kramer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Simonson, absolutely. Our, I, what I'm very proud about, if you haven't seen this yet, the 60-second commercial that started running, 
features all five campuses. It features Minnesota, and this is very much a Minnesota campaign. Uh, I was able to visit Crookston uh, a week ago or so Monday with two of my colleagues, and uh, Chancellor Holesclaw, I know I'll get this number wrong, but I think very similar to Worthington, uh, the chancellor challenged us and said, what is the percentage of Hispanic students in the K-12 system in Crookston? I think I guessed 18 percent, and Chancellor, I believe it was 33, 34 percent. That is our next generation of student, and finding ways to demonstrate University of Minnesota engagement with them is absolutely key so that as they go through high school, they're thinking University of Minnesota, and they're not thinking University of Minnesota Twin Cities or Crookston, or Morris, or Duluth, or Rochester. They're thinking the system, and then they'll find their best fit. Thank you. Thank you, Jim Powell. Um, thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, I also, uh, 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 Vice President Kramer, want to thank you for the, the work and the presentation. I echo uh, Regent Simonson, the system work and the system landing page and just the, you know, the, the clarity uh, you know, that that brings to the system, I think, is is very, very positive. Um, one um, question, and you know, it's really a, a concern of mine that I want to raise, really cuts in the, in the, in the opposite direction. And, and as, as valuable and as essential um, a system communication is, and the way, and you know, the uh, elements that you've put in place to drive that, there is a role, uh, I think, for very strong communication of the specific benefits of the components of the, of the system. And, um, and that doesn't, you know, I'm not in any way trying to detract uh, from the system role. And, and because, you know, certainly Crookston, Morris, Rochester, Duluth, these, these, are, these campuses offer unique, uh, you know, and I think very powerful benefits uh, to, you know, the, you know, the, the student that's, that's looking for that. And I, I just, uh, you know, encourage us to you know, make sure that we're, we're also thinking about that piece of it. I've had brief conversations with uh, Chancellor Holtz Claus about Crookston, and I know enough to be dangerous. We talked a little bit about the, e the equine program there, which is really, really good and it has, would have broad appeal, uh, you know, outside of our state or even, even the Midwest and, you know, and the desire to, you know, find those kids. And who you know? So so I'm interested in in in, in that piece as well. Um, I, I I do sometimes worry that we might not be investing enough in that kind of direct marketing as it relates to recruiting and enrollment. And so that's just a that's just a, a thought for you. And then I'll close by saying I'll do everything I can to get you in the Golden Valley Shopper. What we can talk after. <laughs> <laughs> Vice President Kramer. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Powell, um, we can't wait. Um, and then I, I would offer, um, because, sir, you and I have chatted about this, um, I would be happy to come back, whether we do it formally or informally, and talk about the landscape of reputational marking versus admissions marking. And I, I don't know the entire system, or the entire North America, but we have done a lot of work on the Big Ten. And I, I'm more than happy to acknowledge that some of our peers have dramatically reduced their reputational marketing in, and instead have taken that dollars primarily, I'm, I'm guessing, and we can find out more, through budget pressures or deliberately through admission strategies to say, let's build admissions marketing. I know there is a place for, and I will strongly advocate for, reputational marketing. It builds that advocacy and awareness statewide. But I don't disagree, and Mr. Chair, Regent Powell, I'm happy to do further research at your discretion and come back, again, either informally or formally with a presentation that we can dive deep on the Big Ten and understanding why at least three of our peers that I know of have almost zeroed out their reputational marketing in favor of admissions marketing. Other, uh, Regent Anderson? Uh, very briefly, I, I really didn't need to say much. I'm just going to comment to a couple of my colleagues. Um, Regent Simonson has not been here long enough, but he brought up the deal about our first-gen students yesterday we ate lunch with, and, and I just want to point out, because you come from not too far from where I do in western Minnesota, that uh, within the last couple of years we have been able to use reallocations, and it's not perfect, but to... Uh, get what we call the land-grant legacy scholarship for people in rural Minnesota, kids in rural Minnesota. It's a need-based scholarship, and I think we have about 100 kids per year that, that benefit from that that wasn't here then. Um, follow up with the, with the Golden Valley Shopper, uh, you will be receiving rate sheets for the Alexandria Echo Press also. <laughs> Thank you. Regional uh, newspapers are getting a, a heyday here. Did you have a reply? Uh, 
You don't no, need to. No, Mr. Chair, but I do have a closing comment that's Very unrelated good. to anything else if there are no other questions. Wind us down here. I think we're done. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, yesterday during the course of your discussion about a new vice president, I received several text messages asking, why are they talking about you in this portion? Um, I would note Kramer is spelled with a K, uh, Professor Kramer or now Vice President of Research spells with a C, and I'd ask your indulgence in terms of perhaps occasionally introducing a first name every once in a while. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Vice President Matt Kramer, thank you for your work. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Your first name, Peter. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right. This uh, takes us through our scheduled business for the day and uh, into reporting and, uh, and approving committee work from yesterday, of which there was a considerable amount. We'll start with our uh, heavy lifters, uh, uh, Regent Anderson and the Finance and Operations Committee. You're going first today. Okay. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Um, the Finance and Operations Committee, we actually acted on eight items this month. Um, yesterday, we well, I'm just going to preface this. Yesterday, we acted on two in one vote. I'm breaking them out into two separate votes here, so if somebody doesn't approve of one or the other, they're welcome to vote yay or nay on as their discussion. So starting here we go. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the state biennial budget request for fiscal 20 and 21. I move approval of this resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Chair McMillan. That carries. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the 2018 six-year capital plan. I move approval of this resolution. Second. Right. second. Been moved and seconded on the capital plan uh, request. Discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Very good. Thank you. The committee voted to recommend approval of the resolution related to the 2019 state capital request. I move approval of this resolution. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with the law enforcement labor services. I move approval of this resolution. Moved and seconded. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Continue. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to the proposed labor agreement with International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 292. I move approval of this resolution. Second. That's been moved and seconded. No discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the amendment to the fiscal year 2019 annual capital improvement budget for the ice rink refrigerant and HVAC replacement at the Sports and Health Center Duluth campus. I move approval of this capital improvement budget amendment. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Discussion on the HVAC ice rink at Duluth. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? That carries. Thank you. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the sale of 24.17 acres of the Oregon, the Aurora, Oregon Research Station. I move approval of the real estate transaction. Second. Moved and seconded for the Oregon real estate sale. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. The committee separated one item from the revised version of the second consent report second version of the consent report. I move the rest of the consent report first and then we'll move the additional item. What we're moving to at this time is the committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes a central reserves contingency fund allocation for the presidential search, purchase of goods and services of 1 million and over, a resolution related to the settlement of the Cook DHS arbitration, and an employment agreement for the vice president of research. I move approval of the revised version two consent report. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. Discussion on that, uh, that collection of items. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Very good. Continue, Regent Anderson. The committee voted to recommend approval of an amendment, amended employment agreement for the Director of Athletics, Twin Cities Campus. I move approval of the amended employment agreement. Second. Very good. That's been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? Mr. Chair? 
Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we obviously spoke about this at length yesterday, but for preservation of the record, I just want to um, state that uh, my, my position on this issue is that this would be an, uh, appropriately um, done in consultation with the incoming president, as it is a direct report to the president. I note that um, Director Coyle is currently in a, his contract has two, in a, two years, seven months remaining. It would have over two years remaining at that point. So we are reaching forward into the new president's um, tenure and, and, and making a determination for her or him as that person is identified. Um, I regret that this is here. I feel that um, I would have much preferred that we had the opportunity to talk about it when we would all have the ability to, to focus on the substance of the, of the matter itself. And I want to ensure that um, Director Coyle understands that, you know, from my perspective, I think he's done a very strong job in, um, in, in his role and that this is, is in no way an indication of, of any criticism of his performance. Um, I would also note that um, I, I have a level of discomfort, uh, and this came out in the conversation when we talked about uh, the basis for the terms being altered. Um, away from a, a symmetrical relationship of risk um, to one where there is a, as a, a President Kaler described it, and I'm paraphrasing, that, that there was more freedom provided um, to Director Coyle, which of course runs contrary to this concept of, of uh, um, you know, wanting to be here. It's, if, that's a, if that's a value, that, that would be inconsistent with that, and that, that raises my concern. And so the last, the last point I'll make with respect to that is, um, is that you know, based on not only reaching forward and making a determination uh, that, that should be um, for the uh, incoming president, uh, we are providing terms that maximize the risk for the incoming president, meaning that if we enjoy success, uh, we have fewer, uh, uh, we have less leverage, I should say, for, continue, for the continuing the, the relationship, um, in, in meaning that it's easier for um, marketing that success uh, to other suitors uh, but if we are, don't achieve success and, and perhaps run into challenges, which departments sometimes do, we never see them coming until they are here, um, we are going to be you know, fully uh, uh, committed financially um, to, to maintaining that relationship. I, I don't think that that's optimal for the incoming president. And so to that extent, I, I publicly state that, that uh, Director Coyle is doing a good job, and I have great you know, hope and faith in his continued success and in, in that we will uh, come out of our rebuilding phase in major sports and, and into uh, the success that um, that we all seek for the university. Um, that, but that being said, I, I don't believe this is prudent. I don't think it is consistent with good governance. Uh, I don't think that everybody knew what the terms were um, prior, you know, prior to committing to support, and I think that's unfortunate, and I would hope that we would avoid um, these kinds of uncomfortable moments uh, going forward. Uh, and so for that, I'm going to vote no. Other? Discussion before I call for a vote on the uh, Mr. Regent Johnson. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Um, not to uh, replay yesterday's discussion, and Regent Rocha has made some uh, important, thoughtful points. Uh, it's a matter of governance. But I think overshadowing um, those points in a very positive way with uh, Athletic Director Coyle, upon reflection yesterday's discussion and some discussions with members of the public, I think we are doing the, hopefully doing the right thing by extending um, Athletic Director Coyle's uh, contract. Uh, when we consider in a short period of time that he's been here, uh, the hires of major coaches I think is outstanding. You know, the hiring of Coach Mosco and Coach Whalen, Coach Flack, Coach uh, Patino, those kinds of uh, high level hires along with other, other coaches, but even more importantly, my fellow regions, is now the transparency and accountability of the finances of the Department of Athletics. Um, that is extreme, extremely important to have that accountability. Even more important is the uh, performance of our student athletes in the classroom and in the lab. Uh, continue to show demonstrated improvement. And as I said yesterday in conclusion, uh, I for one don't want to have Director Coyle leave this university. And I think by extending his contract, we will assure uh, for the next four to five years 
uh, unless there's unusual circumstances, he will uh, be retained here as our athletic director. Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Regent Chu. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, I don't <clears throat> want to go through everything from yesterday, but I do, I do think it's unfortunate that uh, we're taking this decision away from the incoming president. Regent Rocha, something new or? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I just, I just want to ensure that, that the juxtaposition of what I said with Regent Johnson's thoughtful commentary of the successful uh, efforts of the current AD suggests that I don't share that view, but my objection is based on the governance principle, the fact that I don't believe that the, the timing between now and, and I, I, the identification of the new person would, would carry a, a, an undue risk um, that we could do the same thing uh, with that person having the stamp of approval that I believe that position should have. And that certainly anybody that would be looking at coming into a position like that would, I, I believe, want to have the respect of that, of that opportunity. So I, I, I share your, your, your uh, sen sentiments with respect to the performance. I just, again, don't want it to be implied by your statement that I'm not saying the same thing. I'm saying that for different reasons, I don't think this is appropriate for this board at this time. And I would assume most regents that spoke up yesterday would also want to clarify that their silence now doesn't mean they're changing their position from yesterday. So I don't want to re-debate any of that. I appreciate the comments from all three of the regents that have spoken. I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Very good. That carries. Do you have uh, more business, Regent Thank Anderson? You. Thank you, Chair McMillan. That concludes my report. Very good. On to uh, audit and compliance. Regent Cohen, I don't know that you had any action items, but... Uh, you're right. Thanks, <laughs> Chair McMillan. There are no action items this month. Uh, the committee received an update on internal audits performed since June. Chief Auditor Klatt uh, reported that 34% of recommendations rated as essential were implemented. Often it's a little higher than that at 40%. Um, the committee discussed the risk mitigation plans for campus safety and crisis response with Vice Presidents Bertelson and Kramer along with Chief Public Relations Officer Chuck Tombarge. This is part of the committee's ongoing discussions of the university's institutional risk profile and associated mitigation plans. And lastly, Senior Vice President Burnett and Vice President Brown provided the committee with an update on the progress in addressing the findings of the August 2018 audit report on employment eligibility verification, commonly known as I-9, the discussion included an overview of the improvements being made moving forward, as well as the remediation of existing issues. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Cohen. As a uh, longtime member of the legal community and a longtime member of the Litigation Review Committee, I, uh, it was a hard sell for me to switch to audit and compliance, but under Regent Powell and Regent Cohen's leadership, that has become committee I look forward to, and uh, very, very excellent conversations there yesterday's <clears throat> included. So Regent Beeson, Litigation Review. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, your former committee. Uh, <laughs> a lot of action, but no action items. Uh, we did meet yesterday, and we adopted a resolution authorizing the closing of the meeting to discuss matters uh, subject to attorney-client privilege. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair of uh, Mission Fulfillment Committee and uh, Chair yesterday, Regent Lucas. Thank you, Chair McMillan. Uh, the Mission Fulfillment Committee had only one action item this month, and it was the consent report. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes academic program additions, changes, and discontinuations, and conferral of tenure for outside hires. I move approval of the consent report. Is there a second? Second. Very good. That's moved and seconded. Discussion on the Mission Fulfillment Consent Report. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Can't make it. That carries. Thank you. That concludes my report. <clears throat> that takes us to uh, Regent Rocha with our morning uh, committee and another excellent discussion, Governance and Policy Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The Governance and Policy Committee considered one action item this month. Uh, the committee voted unanimously to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to the bylaws of the Board of Regents. As noted earlier this morning, this requires two motions, which under Robert's rules compare, uh, carry a, an implied second. First, 
I move that the Board of Regents hereby suspends, pursuant to Article 10 of the bylaws, the 30 calendar day notification requirement of Article 9 of the bylaws. I have uh, long wondered about the implied versus expressed, but we have adopted a, a strong practice of uh, express seconds. So is there an express second? <laughs> Very good. It's expressly seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? I will keep pushing the rock up the hill. I'm kind of on your side on that one, but uh, it's a tough uh, practice to overcome. So Next, I move that the Board of Regents adopts the proposed amendments to the bylaws as presented to the Governance and Policy Committee on October 12, 2018. And I second it, Mr. Chair. Moved and seconded by the Chair. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That carries as well. Thank you, Chair McMillan. That concludes my report. Thank you, Regent Rocha. Is there any old business to come before the Board of Regents? Any new business? Then I would happily entertain a motion to adjourn and ask Regent Swiggum to note the time. So we'll move. Move it. All in Second. favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Wow, that's a record. Oh. David. Okay. Made up. Ooh, this is a record.